All right, it is 5.30, should we get started? Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Megan Rust, Educator for Interpretation at the Frist Art Museum. Thank you for joining us for today's conversation with We Count artists, Bazar Aradini, Granusha Kolshi, and Sean Giles. We'll begin with a land acknowledgement. The Frist Art Museum's building sits on land that Cherokee and Shawnee native peoples and elders call their homeland. We acknowledge and pay respect to them. We also acknowledge and offer deep gratitude to the ancestral land and water that support us. Today's conversation is presented in conjunction with the exhibition, We Count First Time Voters. The exhibition was organized by the Frist Art Museum and is on view on our website at fristartmuseum.org slash we count and in the Conte Community Arts Gallery. Today is also Constitution Day, commemorating the day in 1787 that delegates to the Constitutional Convention signed the document in Philadelphia. It's fitting that today we're discussing the important constitutional right granted to citizens here in the United States that was reinforced by the 15th, 19th, and 26th Amendments, the right to vote. The First Start Museum would like to thank sponsors of We Count First Time Voters, presenting sponsor HCA Foundation on behalf of HCA TriStar Health. The exhibition is supported in part by Ryman Hospitality Properties Foundation, Neil and Harwell PLC, and O'Keefe Circle members. And as always, we appreciate the continued operating support from Metro Nashville Arts Commission, Tennessee Arts Commission, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Throughout the conversation tonight, we'll take questions from the audience. Please submit your questions via the Q&A feature anytime throughout the presentation. And thank you in advance for your patience with us as we present this program online. In the event of a technical difficulty, we'll pause the presentation and we'll work quickly to resolve the issue. If you're having technical difficulties on your personal device, please use the chat feature to send a message to Frist IT. Now it's my pleasure to turn things over to the Frist Assistant Director of Community Engagement, Sean Giles, We Count Artist Bazar Aradini, and Dranusha Kolshi. Thank you, Megan. And thanks to everyone who's joined us this evening. Um, we are thrilled to be bringing you the fourth conversation um, with the We Count artists. For uh, you all who aren't familiar with the We Count exhibition, uh, this show uh, entitled We Count, First Time, Visit, uh, First Time Voters, is uh, a show of uh, five uh, local artists, each of whom was um, to go out and speak with a local person about their first time voting experience. And so with, with that conversation uh, came a lot of other wonderful facts and background and details that um, really uh, developed into a very rich and powerful exhibition. And so uh, Bezar Aradini, Aradini is one of the five artists who participated. And uh, this evening, we are thrilled to speak with her and with Dranusha Koshi, who is the subject of her portrait. So um, we're going to begin with uh, that conversation this evening. And uh, first, I'll just start by uh, Bezar. I'll let you introduce yourself and then Dranusha, uh, you can introduce yourself as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sean, and thank you everyone for joining this afternoon. My name is Bazar Aradini. I am a fiber textile artist here in Nashville, Tennessee. Hi, my name is Dranusha Kolshi. Um, I'm a hairstylist uh, locally and a writer here in Nashville, Tennessee. Great. Thank you both. And I'll just begin, uh, Bazar, with you. Uh, and a simple question, uh, what made you want to be part of this project when we brought it to you? What, what intrigued you? Um, I think 
one of the responsibilities of being a citizen is to engage in community um, community work and be aware of issues within your community. Um, so to engage with someone that is part of our community and share their story um, was a great opportunity. Um, and so thank you for allowing me to do that. Absolutely. Um, looking at the theme of, of voting and of, of citizenship, uh, what was it that seemed to connect with you uh, personally as well? Um, what was it about uh, that theme that really touched you personally and made you would want to go go forth with this? Absolutely. Uh, so um, Janush and I both uh, share similar backgrounds in that our parents fled their homelands um, to come to America to seek freedom. So my parents actually immigrated here in 1992 in Nashville. Um, so they had to go through the process of becoming naturalized and to do so it gained um, protection, um, freedom to express their own culture, um, but also it gave their children citizenship. So that's actually how I became naturalized. Um, so, to, so it did, it was very personal for me in a way too, to interview Janusha and kind of share her story. And uh, Janusha and uh, Bezar, you both knew each other uh, before this project? Yeah, we, I think it was like two, three years. Uh, we've always like exchanged conversations, very similar conversations about our families and um, kind of growing up in Nashville. Yeah, uh, we met through a haircut actually. Um, our friend Megan set us up and she was like, you guys have to meet. Um, my friend Megan was helping me with a poetry project I was doing at that time and I was very new to poetry and um, I was explaining why I did it and my story and my background. And she was like, you have to meet Bazar. And then Bazar made an appointment. And then we just, I think it felt so much like home in a way that I've never experienced before because both of us are in very similar cultures and little ways here and there, you know, you can pick up tiny pieces of it. And uh, I guess just uh, to kind of get, pull, pull people into your process, Bezar, uh, we already have your uh, piece pulled up. And really, this is a collaboration between you two, uh, which makes this piece unique mm -hmm. um, because uh, the, the poem was actually written by Janusha. So uh, you both contributed to this piece um, in more, more than just the conversation. Um, so Bezar, tell us a little bit about uh, you as an artist and the kind of work you, you, you typically do outside of this project. Okay, um, so my personal work uh, really explores my family's um, immigration story, but even my own personal experience of living in diaspora, but also exploring the larger issues of cultural displacement and the duality that kind of um, lies in this very liminal space of living. Um, so I kind of work with all these topics and issues. Um, I might share my screen and kind of give some examples. Let's see. So I got into thread work, I mean embroidery. Um, thread for me symbolizes resilience, um, strength. It's such a crucial tool to everything in life. Um, sewing is such a life skill to have. And so I started taking my family story and just embroidering simple portraits of my family coming into America, um, images of my family in the refugee camps. Um, that's where I was born. So I would take these images and just recreate them in thread, um, truly just to unravel my own identity, trying to kind of longing for a connection to it. Um, so I would take these images and just work with them. This is an image of my mother when we first came to America. I think she's at Centennial Park. Um, she still had her traditional Kurdish clothes. Um, and then you've got this very like modern landscape in the background. Um, this is a family portrait, kind of seeing the transition of cultural clothes to more like Americanized lifestyle. Um, so then I just started moving past just my family story and thinking it back again to my own personal experiences and thinking about what were, what were the means and tools of creativity for my ancestors and my family members of creating, of surviving oppression. And it always went back to thread and embroidering. And so I just continued with extended family portraits and 
would sometimes take people out of the portraits, um, but would focus on just one or two people and kind of sew them onto this very delicate fabric um, so that they're free form. They're not tied down to any certain space. You don't know where they're at. And I just continued, and I, and I mean, this is really what I still do. I just work between two different or a couple of series. And um, depending on how much <laughs> my eyes and hands hurt, I, I switch off between the two series. So yeah, so honestly, it's, um, it's, a lot of, uh, it's a lot of patience and a lot of um, creativity to healing as well. Um, this became a very therapeutic process for me and hopefully for those that also resonate with this um, similar story of mine. Let's share, here's a couple more. And this is the, one of the latest ones I've did. Um, which is an image of my grandmother. I never met her, but again, just longing uh, for a connection um, to these people that are my relatives that I never got to meet, um, even to this day. So even repeating the image is just, again, just trying to find some kind of connection. Great, thank you, Beza. Absolutely. Um, so, Janusha, what made you uh, interested in, in being a part of this project and sharing your story? Um, when Bazar approached me about this, um, she was like, I don't know if you're down for this, but there's this project that I'm working on. And um, I was wondering if I could, you know, do your portrait pretty much. <laughs> and it started there and I was like, of course, like, the naturalization process was kind of happening at that time. I had my application in um, and Bazar was aware of that and we had been talking about it and I was kind of, it, it was the extensive part of the application process. It was a lot of the paperwork and making sure that everything's mailed in properly and it's such a st stressful process that I felt like this was almost like a, the light <laughs> of all of the stress, it gave me something to feel proud of in the moment, <laughs> almost. And I just, I never thought my story was as special until I met Bazar. and I would do any project she ever asks me to. I respect her so much. So that's how it started for me. And then as it progressed and as she showed me what she was working on, um, she asked me, to write a poem uh, and we were at her house and I was like, well, I actually have written a poem that is kind of going with the theme of what you're doing. And um, I kind of tweaked it a little uh, for the piece, but for the most part, I felt like this manifestation was happening where these two ideas were living and existing at the same time. And they just like found each other in that moment. and. It was really special. It's really special still. Thank you. So Janusha, um, when you all had these, uh, when you all got together to sort of talk about this, of course you had to share uh, your story. So did you focus primarily on the uh, naturalization process that you were going through or did you kind of give a backstory on your history and sort of how you got to where you were? Um, I think it's in a way uh, like Bazar was talking about earlier it is the duality of it for for me. Um, I feel like with the poem it is a repetitive saying of my native tongue um, in the English language you know, and uh, that's like the first part of the space, like the Albanian version is underneath that my sister translated. Um, but the top is an English talking about my Albanian, like my Kosovarian experience during the war. And I feel like I, that's kind of how I portrayed that duality of it both. And I feel like with this whole process, it's kind of been both of those at the same time, the whole time, thinking of why I'm getting naturalized, 
brought me straight into those memories of what I had to do to get here. And then as I learned more about America through this process and learned, you know, the questions I had to learn in that process, it brought me even closer to understanding why I came here. And then it just felt like they were just stacking on top of each other and creating this whole understanding that I've, I have, I hadn't experienced until that moment. And you had actually been in the United States for some time. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what, was, what was your experience like? At just in, how, how did you exist in the United States, knowing that you weren't a naturalized citizen for some time? And have you noticed a difference since you became naturalized? Um, um, yeah, big difference. I think my experience before was there was always this fear. Um, I, a couple of my cousins had been deported while I was a child and uh, I was raised in Antioch, Tennessee locally and a couple of my cousins were deported around that time. And I think that has like existed in me, that fear of that I could just not be here one day um, was really scary and kept me from existing fully. <laughs> in this country. And afterwards, I, I remember the day that I realized I passed my test. It was this heaviness that had been sitting on me for so long. I think I was so used to it at that point that when it left me, when I realized that I won't have to worry about that ever again, it felt so much, so, so light that I am able to exist and make mistakes and um, not worry about what my future will look like and how I could visit my home, like back to Kosovo if I ever wanted to, you know? So it was, it was, it was, it, it was, it was things that I feel like I never thought about when I wasn't naturalized because I knew I couldn't have these things. So I just let it become something that didn't exist completely. That afterwards I felt like so many doors had opened for me and I'm able to vote. And I think after the last election, I felt this devastation I hadn't felt about not being able to vote, you know? Cause I thought the people, I felt like the people around me were here for me and when it, I couldn't participate, I felt like I had no control over what the people around me could do for me, you know? So that was also such a powerful change. Yes, that definitely sounds uh, like something that you sort of carried with you even when you weren't realizing how, how heavy a burden that would. Yeah. So, um, we started with Bazar, sort of your your work and how you go through your process, uh, and Dranusha, your story. Um, so where does this converge where we come up with this uh, beautiful work of art? Uh, Bazar, um, what was your thought process uh, after speaking with Dranusha? And um, kind of what, how did you figure out, okay, I want to do this and, you know, I want Dranusha to, to contribute a poem to it. How did you kind of think through that? Okay, um, so when I got asked to do this project, I was like, Janusha would be perfect for this. Mm -hmm. um, but I also thought about the way we are identified within society. Um, I thought about IDs, um, the importance of citizenship, who citizenship protects, um, but also the common, how citizenship is a common thread that um, between most of us Americans. So I also knew after hearing her um, story, I wanted her portrait to be just massive, to be larger than life, um, almost forcing the viewer to engage in her story, um, to be part of her story, but also to have some representation and visibility on her identity, um, especially with stories that are similar that aren't often represented. So I did thread again, thinking about the material of thread um, this resilient tool 
and started working on her portrait on this very delicate mesh like fabric. So she's, her whole body is almost weighs this thing down that's been wrapped around the frame. But going back to the idea of even like a ID and identification, um, rather than simple things that describe her description, um, I wanted something that says more about her story. Um, and I knew Janusha was, had been writing poems. And so I asked her if she would um, kind of collaborate and, and write a poem that, that gave more about her story versus just her descriptions of hair color and eye color. Um, so her story kind of represents all of our personal stories. So you have both of them um, going hand in hand. Okay. Um, and so with that, um, Janusha, what did you, uh, I don't, I sound like I'm having some, some minor issues with the sound, but I think it's okay. Um, so Janusha, uh, I'm kind of interested in um, sort of where you are now, um, now that you've been a naturalized citizen for, what, has it been a year yet? Oh, um, no, it hasn't. November is when I got naturalized. Okay. Three months. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, have you had an opportunity to vote yet? Yes, uh, I voted locally uh, mm -hmm. recently, which was really cool. It was very special. <laughs> it was cheesy special. Like my <laughs> friends think it's like, they did like a photo op moment. So I felt like a kid in a candy shop, you know? <laughs> Great. Um, and I, I see uh, Megan that we have some question in the Q&A if we want to go to one of those. Yes, um, this question is either for Bezor or Dranusha. Um, the viewer writes, my question comes from my experience as someone who came to the United States as an adolescent convinced that voting didn't matter. Um, this viewer is from Puerto Rico um, and has since changed his mind but wants to know um, what you all could say to, to people that maybe are, um, you know, questioning whether or not um, they should vote or they're questioning their belief in the system. Um, how, how can you share, you know, from your personal experience, the importance of participating in elections? I feel like we both have a very- Yeah, I know. <laughs> Go first. <laughs> So I feel like I have to have a lot of conversations with my family. I mean, a couple of them are naturalized in my family. So it's my sister, um, my brothers, and my dad, and then my sister-in-laws and my mom are still not naturalized. And our culture, my dad votes in Kosovo. He votes for... Uh, politics there because he lives there most of the time he only visits here but I think the way that my culture understands America is that we only came here to make sure our family safe and to make sure we have money to live and eat and have a roof over our heads when you bring in like democracy from such a traumatized population of humans that have, you know, fled war or have fled a really bad circumstance or even just came here just for economic reasons strictly, they just need more money, then it's hard for them to understand and step away from that survival. And I feel like I didn't understand for a very, very long time until really, and until I got naturalized the importance because I was able to now and I understood that I was able to take in the information a lot differently than my family could. And I think Bezar and I have had this conversation a lot. We take it so seriously because we, we are seeing a different side of it through the arts and through, you know, our friends and the people around us that this is our country as well. 
And I think that's hard for people to grab when home is so far away and here is just where we are to survive, you know? Absolutely. So um, to add in on that, I think, I know my family comes from a culture where we're, we weren't given the right to um, politically engage. So Kurds have been impressed for so long. So um, to vote, that was our voice. Um, and we weren't allowed that. So when we came to America, that was a way for us to participate. And even becoming a citizen, it's almost like your responsibility to do so. Um, and even if you're not going to do it for yourself, think about your community again. Think about the people that are in your neighborhood, um, people that don't have the chance to vote. Um, that's honestly the way I kind of see it is if I'm not voting for myself, I will vote for my neighbor or for someone that doesn't have the right. Um, because I knew how hard it was for my parents to get to gain that right. Um, when they became citizens, it really, really did give them recognition and um, a voice back. So I, I think if that answered you, uh, the question, I think it, it, for those reasons, um, if not for yourself, I know it's easy to lose hope in democracy and and, and everything that's going on, but I think it's also probably one of the most important times to get involved. Do you think your art, Bazar, or your writing, Dranusha, plays a role in, in communicating this importance? I, I mean, I hope so. I, I, I was hoping that in every way that this would kind of represent um, the stories that we aren't told, the stories that we're not familiar with, um, to engage those people too. Um, not just the familiar stories of voting, but to show that there's a process to gain this. It's not just given to anyone and everyone. Um, I know for my mother, it was like an awful experience. Um, she almost fell twice. And once you fell twice, you're not allowed to become a citizen. And so therefore your kids have to wait till they're 18 to gain that. Um, so it, it's, it, it was troubling. And, and I, so I guess I hope that this portrait kind of got people to get be more involved and start thinking about voting. I, I feel the same way. I feel like this, this whole, I feel like I started poetry to heal myself. I started writing poetry to heal so many traumatic experiences that I had through, you know, coming to America and experiencing my family, just learning a new life. And I also feel like it, poetry and art in general are always political and in every form because we exist in politics. We are a part of the fabric of the government and the society that we're a part of. So I feel like when artists are creating, they're creating the history that we are living in. And I feel like I've been grabbing onto that understanding in a different way, especially after this project, because it showed me the, it showed me through art the importance of democracy and voting and being a part of change and evolution of our country and the world, really. We've got a couple other questions for, for Bazar. Um, Bazar, since you normally do family portraits, do you feel like um, this portrait of Dranusha was a departure from your regular work, or did you feel like Dranusha became a part of your family in the process? Oh, she's absolutely part of my family. <laughs> um, but no, absolutely not. I love doing community projects. Um, I, I, every time I've been asked to do a community project, I love doing them. I love engaging with people that are, that I live close to, um, I want to know people in my community. So um, no, it's absolutely not a departure from my own personal work. I think even the process, I always talk about how my process is sometimes more important than the artwork itself. Um, embroidery for me, like Jernia just said, it's, it was a healing process. Um, it became a way for me to even slow down and to think about these things, these large ideas and, and, things that I had to struggle with, um, kind of work through, through them, through my process. But I wouldn't separate them, honestly. Um, I don't think it takes me away from my own personal work either. Uh, my personal work, I think it's, will always be there as a healing process for myself. 
And um, what are the scale, what's the scale of your embroidery works? I know you mentioned that this portrait of Janusha is larger than life, but your other pieces, are they large as well or are they on a smaller scale? They're on smaller scale. Um, I like the idea of a four by six, just like a photo, keeping them that size. Um, some of them are a little larger, but most of the very hand, smaller hand embroidered uh, portraits are four by six. A follow-up question that just came in to that. How was the shift from working in smaller intimate scales to larger speed, larger pieces? And would you work large again? Uh, it was horrifying, but I did it. <laughs> it, um, it was a great, great challenge for myself. Honestly, I love doing the, um, a, a big portrait like this. Um, and I would do it again. It just takes a lot of patience um, and practicing that. So it was a good opportunity for sure. So, uh, Bezar, how long did it take you to actually do this portrait? I want to say two and a half months. This is like five days a week consistent work. So, <laughs> um, I, I would take breaks because if I don't, my either my neck or my hands start hurting. But um, two and a half months, which isn't bad when you think about some paintings that take years. Well, I also wanted to ask you both. Um, what did you all learn through this process? Did you learn anything about uh, yourselves or each other? Um, and, you know, having known each other for some time, did this sort of uh, shed any light on anything that you didn't realize before? Um, Bezar, I'll start with you. I think um, going back to like thinking about practicing patience um, and getting involved in the community. Um, is, is are the two things I learned the most, how important those things are. Um, as far as Dranosha and I, I feel like our relationship is always growing and we're always learning new things. And um, so that's, that's there. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that statement. Um, <laughs> I feel like everything that Bezar just said, same. I, we, I feel like the whole time this was happening, it, it felt like her and I just kept having moments of conversation where it was strictly about our culture, which doesn't happen very often in day-to-day -day life. And I, was, I felt like I was able to process a lot more and um, also having the experience to get my sister involved and hearing a lot of her memories that she had never told me about from that time and ex understanding that she also is a writer. She just hasn't written, you know, in a, since her 20s. And that was, that was a lot for me to take in and was healing me because I felt like I picked up writing strictly to heal myself. And then I felt like that extension was healing others. And I feel like now this whole conversation and everything we're speaking about and all of the artists are also part of that healing. So it was just, I feel like I just learned the power of the arts in huge way. And did this, um, I guess, again, a question for both of you, have you all noticed um, sort of a response from uh, the community around you? Um, have they sort of reacted differently or um, has anything been different about them? Um, uh, Janusha, Janusha, I'll start with you. Um, I think maybe in ways where a lot of people didn't know the my past, uh, mm -hmm. my story, and I feel like that was such a that was such a big moment because I it, it was this acknowledgement again exactly what Bazar wanted from the piece. It was this acknowledgement of like the person aside from the naturalization, who they are and what their story is and how they got there. And that started conversations. I mean, I, I, I'm a hairstylist, so a lot of my clients have seen this um, and they're just, that was starting a conversation about the politics of America because of what happened to my people when I came to America and why I fled my country with my family. and. Yeah, I feel like the community has definitely 
my, my little community of hey, you know, clients at my salon has the conversations have shifted for sure. Uh, yeah, I would add to that, um, as far as conversations, I've had people contacting me, telling me their stories about becoming naturalized. Um, actually, a few of them talking about becoming naturalized right before 2016. And honestly, some of the stories I heard were really sad because they would have fellow Americans be like, oh, why'd you become a citizen of America? It was kind of like mocking them in a way. And to not know where we come from and the political oppression that we come from, um, it's kind of just disheartening to like not validate that at all. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, but hearing more conversations of people that became uh, became naturalized again, I didn't I didn't go through that process myself. So it was eye opening to have people of my generation be like, "Hey, I grew up in America and I just got naturalized for this reason or that reason, but very similar reasons as to what I'm saying about coming from very extreme situations back home." Mm -hmm. And uh, I see, Megan, we have some more Q&A. Yes, um, one of those questions actually just sort of expands on what you're talking about, Bazar, um, coming from a place that's seen such oppression from people that look the same as you. How do you talk to white Americans about oppression and systemic racism? Do you include your own story as an example of how governments can commit atrocities? And that's for both you and or for Janusha. I try to um, share my story as much as I can. Whoever asks me questions or wants to know more, I am always open um, to talk about the Kurds. Um, there, I wouldn't compare, compare it. There are comparisons, but there's not any comparisons with America, American history to Kurdish history. But um, in ways our people have, and to this day, we're the largest population in the world without our own nation. There's 400 sorry, four, 40 million Kurds um, within four different countries that do not have their own nation. And so going back to having a voice, these people are living in, in areas where they participate in a government that really does not see them. Um, and in some parts, they can't even participate. Um, so I try to share my story just to get people aware of the people in Nashville. I mean, Nashville is really diverse. There's stories like mine, there's other stories. There's, um, that might, may be similar or not, but they're, they're all very important. Yeah, I, again, agree with Bazar. I feel like there, again, the similarities that we could use of the systemic racism in America is that somebody's oppressed, you know, in some form, I think, we were oppressed by a different country completely. And I think the circumstances in America that I always try to bring up again in, in my chair with my clients every time I'm at work is that I am passionate about what's happening in America, not because of what I went through and what my story is, but because there are people in this country being oppressed systemically to where it's not just fleeing war it's not just fleeing you know bombs and you know the atrocities of war in that form they can't the the, the people that are oppressed in this country black people people of color um trans people that that type of oppression is completely inside of the whole system that we need for survival. You can't, it, it's a little bit more passive. It's a lot more passive in America in a way that sometimes makes me, it doesn't allow me to really grab on to like how different it actually is because it is so hidden right in front of you. And that's not what my family fled from. My family fled from very blatant war. And the, the problems we face in America to this day, since the start to this day is, it's so much deeper and it's, and 
I must say it, it's so much more sinister than I think I, I am learning to process how sinister it is compared to the blatant like bloodshed of a country versus like the, un, like the veiled uh, freedom that this country carries. Very powerful to think about. Um, we have a couple other questions. Um, can you all speak about the title of the work? This might tie into some of the things you said previously. My existence is political. Um, what inspired it and how did you arrive at the title? Um, was it a collaboration between the two of you? It was a collaboration in ways. Um, we would just have these conversations and there was a moment where we were both talking and we were like, people will say to us, oh, I'm not political. Well, for us, we were born in wars um, and even being displaced, there's struggles of living in America. So mm -hmm. it's not an option to us. It's something we have to think about almost every day. Um, so I think that kind of was the seed of the title. Yeah, for sure. It uh, It is my existence, the, the ID, the, the title of it is just saying who you see is you as a person in general, no matter who you are, is political. Everything that we live in is political. And I think that was most of the conversations between Bezar and I since the start of our friendship, since the start of this project. And I feel like it's just been an ever evolving understanding that we just do exist politically. That is that is the that is what life is for us. I see we have a couple more Q and A, so we can go ahead with those. Um, just one more. I think it's more of a, a comment and okay. than a question. But um, Anne, who's the director of the education at, at the Frist, says it's really brave of of both of you to speak out um, and also to create your artwork. Um, Thank you, Anne. <laughs> um, this might be switching gears completely, but maybe that's that's okay. Um, we've had a question about the jewelry that you wear, Janusha. <laughs> oh, I love this. <laughs> um, yeah, I wear a lot of gold, and it's strictly family heirlooms. All of the pieces that I, all of the pieces of jewelry I have on, are from my mom or my dad or my sister. Um, and they're all from different times of their lives. I wear them to remind myself what I'm here for and who I'm here for. And that no, I really started wearing them because it's my mom's but and my dad's. But I think as time went on, I realized it was such a healing process to like hold them with me no matter where I go. I was in New Orleans at the beginning of the year and I wrote a poem about my hand necklace and it was about <clears throat> how the red stone in the middle is my mom and she's alive and well but she is also not able to drive doesn't speak english hasn't seen anything but anywhere really except for new york and tennessee you know so i feel like as i move around the world i and as I heal myself, I'm also healing my family. And it's just a constant reminder that that's what I'm doing. But thanks for that question. <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> but, uh, Janusha, you, uh, since you're a writer and you contributed to this piece, um, do you, is, are we able to see you writing anywhere? Do you uh, write regularly? Um, I write regularly. I have been working on a series of poems um, under a woman's hymn. It's on Instagram, you can find it. It's a woman's hymn, H-Y-M-N. Um, I haven't been keeping up with that because, well, my mental capacity is a lot ha uh, full lately than usual. So I mostly just journal now, but there are, you can see the whole process of how a woman's hymn has healed me because I started that account strictly to like keep hold myself accountable to writing for my healing. Um, so you can watch the progression of the poems and like how I grew up during that process. Um, but 
I am working on a couple pieces uh, privately, so I definitely always post about it. I on a woman's hymn website when I do, um, and then a woman's hymn Instagram, too. Okay, and and Beza, are you? I'm sure you're continuing to work, um, and and do you? Uh, will there be opportunities for us to see more work from you in the coming months? Um, absolutely. I think I have some couple of shows around Tennessee planned for the next year, but um, I'm always making work and posting it on Instagram, and I try to keep a pretty steady and consistent practice in my studio. All right. Great. Um, is there anything that you all want to share or kind of share between each other, or um, are there any other questions that we might have from the audience? Would Dranusha be willing to read her poem for us tonight? I would love to. Um, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> this is my existence is political. It is a part of, you know, this. <laughs> okay. My native tongue is wax dripping, fear bubbling to the surface, never spilling over. My native tongue is bitten into, an open wound gushing what could have been if the war had not erupted. My native tongue is currency over lives. 50 marka in a child's pocket just in case a man in a paramilitary uniform needs a fixin'. My native tongue is here nor there, lost in translation. Um, that, that poem is the duality of, again, the English language and also having a native tongue and being a part of that. I was trying to explain it to my friend earlier, why it, why it came to me and that is a, that whole scenario is the ripple effect of my mother deciding to leave our homeland. Um, it was one night in particular, a lot of our family and friends have had already fled and we stayed a little longer because my mom didn't know what to do because my father lived in America at that time. Um, and my, we lived in a, an apartment complex in Pristine, which is the capital of the city of Kosovo. Um, and my sister was looking down from the balcony and sees there were a lot of paramilitary officers and all of that. They were, they were people that were not with the government but were there to cause violence. And my sister looked down and she sees a man in a paramilitary uniform um, doing really horrible things and went to my mom in that moment and she said, we can't stay here any longer. She was 17 or 18 at that time. She said, we have to go. So my mom took, Marka is what we used for currency at that time. Um, and my mom put almost like 50 euros in each of the children's pockets, but mine, and packed blankets. And that's it, <laughs> just blankets. And my grandparents and my siblings and my mom and I fled our apartment. And um, through word of mouth, we knew to go to Macedonia. And we just went to the train and kept going after that. Wow. So that's kind of where the lost in translation comes in. It just, that was the end of it. It was just that very small choice and the actions after it changed our whole understanding of life. And you were, you were still too young to remember that or was that relayed to you as a story or? I remember that experience a little bit, but I do remember the train and the process of coming here. Um, and I was uh, separated from my mom and my siblings, me and my grandparents had to go first because the children and the elders would go first. Um, so we weren't allowed to stay together. And 
it was about a month of us not knowing where we were. Um, they had radio signals at that, radio channels at that time that would just say out names on there to, for people to find each other because so many people had been displaced and lost and you know, fled into the mountains to not be seen for as long as they can. Thank you so much for sharing that the, the detail. Um, so it's amazing how uh, our experiences inform our art in such a way. Um, and I see uh, another question. Looks like this is, yeah, yeah, there's one more. Um, this one is uh, a request to uh, read the poem in your native language, Jerusha. I can definitely try. Um, I have a bit of an accent, but hopefully you guys can't tell. <laughs> Let me see if I can find it. I mean, I could try to read it from there, but. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. Jua ima am tare a shtiru shkrir. Frike që kloxon në superfache që as një her nuk tirdhat. Jua ima am tare a shtkafshuar në plag të hapur. Duke gëllmuar ata që mund të kisht të qen nëse lufta nuk do të kisht shërpëtir. Jua ime amtare është monedhe mbi jetën. Pas djetje marka në shtëpin, në gjepin e fëmije. Vetëm në rrasë se paramilitarë ka nëvoj për një fiksim. Jua ime amtare është këto, ose atje. Humbur në përkëtim. Thank you. Well, uh, Megan, I can turn it back over to you. Um, if there are any other questions, um, feel free to put them in the q and A. I'll give, got a couple more moments here before we, we leave this evening. All right, well, thank you so much for um, attending the program tonight. Thank you, Bazar, thank you, Dranusha, and thank you, Sean. Um, this was such a thought-provoking and amazing experience to hear both of your stories this evening and, and hear how you've shared them through this artwork and We Count First Time Voters. We invite you to see the exhibition at the Frist Art Museum. You can reserve your timed ticket for admission to the museum at fristartmuseum.org. And the first is only $5 right now through October 8th. Um, you can also visit the Conte Community Arts Gallery for free. So we hope you'll come um, and see it, the show in person, or we hope to see you virtually at our next online program. You can find out more about upcoming virtual programs by visiting our website, by following us on social media at First Art Museum, or by signing up for our weekly email newsletter. And as you leave the Zoom tonight, a link for a survey will appear in your browser. Um, your feedback is very important to us and will help us improve future programs. So we appreciate it if you take a few moments to fill that out. And we are so thankful for your support of the Frist Art Museum. Financial gifts during this time allow us to bring you great programming like tonight's event. Um, support of any amount is greatly appreciated. Please consider making a donation at fristartmuseum.org. Thanks again, everyone, and I hope you have a great night. Thank you all. Uh, th thanks, Trinusha and Bezar as well. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye.